I'd also like to thank the organizers and everyone for uh, the opportunity to speak. Um, so I represent a CCP. Um, I would contend, in contrast to some of the previous speakers, that they have been around for various markets since the dawn of them. So it's new for OTC derivatives. That would rather be an aberration where you had a legally agreed organized market that wasn't, for instance, kept in the dark because derivatives weren't enforceable, as was sometimes the case. Um, they have often existed, but we simply don't have a record of how much there was. OTC derivatives, of course, grew tremendously from the late 80s onwards. And the network that created that was created by these contracts, of course, proved to be potentially extremely difficult in crisis times if some or all the members are failing or if they choose, for instance, not to continue to transact with each other. So from my perspective, the whole purpose of a CCP is that you create a system where there was one naturally anyways. Even if it was a dealer-centric system, people benefited from trading more or less the same contracts with each other and the expectation that they could continue to do that and that the promises made in those derivative contracts would be honored. The clearing mandate, of course, enforces you to use a CCP for these, and all of a sudden there is a loss allocation mechanism which ensures that the contracts are enforced as they were agreed at the start. Of course, it's of great interest what happens to the CCP, and one of the reasons why we think, on the other hand, that the legislation and the international standards will be used all the time is they are hopefully going to enhance the incentives for people to keep those probabilities very low. The point was well made, of course, that the likelihood of a GSID failing or failing in a way that it's unable to maintain its critical FMI memberships has been greatly reduced. And we, of course, work actively with both the global as well as the local authorities to ensure that if they would like to keep access to a CCP, we're able to provide that to them. Naturally, we, of course, need that they fulfill the obligations of the member of the CCP. As we're facing the other markets, the CCP always has somebody else on the other side of the contracts. So we will protect our own members if they're unable to do that. However, to keep that probability extremely low, to keep the structure of CCPs where initial margins even before EMEA were sufficiently high to cover the Lehman default, CCPs of course rely on mutualization across their members. This is what keeps everyone in check. From our perspective, one of the challenges with the current legislation is that it, for instance, it includes public money. Of course, yes, one would te be tempted to think that because there are assessment powers that the members have committed ex ante, voluntarily, beyond EMEA, to the CCP to jointly cover losses, that the likelihood of using public funds would be very low. From our perspective, just opening up the possibility, of course, diminishes people's requirements to contribute towards the CCP. That's a sunken cost from their perspective now. If you could get it for free from, later, from somebody else, why would you yourself choose to cover even a small portion of it? I should point out that these are, of course, shared by the market. The intention of the CCP mechanism is to diminish the losses for each of its members by spreading it out across all of them. There is, of course, an important question on how much the end user, the indirect participants of the CCP should pay in these. Certain of the tools affect them perhaps even more than they do the direct members, and there's an important debate to be held around that. From our perspective, the safeguards which were mentioned and all of the, I would say, legal considerations that mirror some of the aspects from other recovery and resolution uh, planning processes are very difficult in the CCP context. Essentially, what we're discussing, of course, is that you have a certain market with lots of participants. They have become unbalanced. And there are two scenarios. Either the market should be continued in more or less its current shape, and we simply need to find replacements for the contracts to make up for the losses that could not be covered from the defaulters' ex ante contributed initial margin in bulk, or we need to shrink the market. This market had overgrown. The survivors are unable to handle the scale of the market that had been built up before, in good times, for instance, and we will use the CCP now as a way to resolve this to make the market suitable for the needs of the economy thereafter. So we really agree with the wording that regulators have often used when they say that CCPs are systemic risk management tools. That is exactly their intention. You can use them in a crisis to determine what needs to continue and who should pay for it. That's exactly the type of loss <coughs> internalization rather than creating negative externalities that we saw happen in the previous crisis and crises before that too. So from that perspective, from our view, we do not think that you need to have things such as compensation, a very strict no credit or worse off safeguard. The intention, of course, is for the market participants to decide if we want continuity, then that's the benefit itself. Why would we be compensated for this from another pocket? Of course, if the compensation is coming from public funds, and this greatly diminishes the CCPs and the authority's ability to enforce ex ante risk management standards. Of course, EMIR and other regulations stipulate confidence intervals, holding periods, and other such features. But in practice, our view is that if the incentives are wrong, if, for instance, people feel that in recovering resolution they can get a better deal than by managing a private solution, then they'll opt to accelerate that. Or they simply won't care about it as much. So it sort of takes the rug out from under the CCP. So from our perspective, we hope that the regulation actually enforces the incentive structure that the market understands that it's for us to fix the situation together. The residual members will all have to bear the losses one way or the other. 
there are different ways of doing the loss apportionment itself, and that's an important conversation which has to be extremely transparent, as everything else in the CCP must. However, from our perspective, that should be the intention of the regulation. That should be used all the time. So we think it should be a sort of living document, a reminder, that if things get out of hand, there's no cake at the end of the waterfall. So those are my very concise concluding remarks. Thank you very much.